and uh, this video we are going to talk about efficient capital markets and behavioral challenges within the finance financial markets context a description of efficient capital markets an efficient capital market is one in which stock prices fully reflect available information information so what we are saying is if all information is available and the price of a stock is reflecting all the information that influences the price then you would have an efficient market now before we continue about the efficient market hypothesis, we want to look at it as a spectrum, not as an on and off switch, as in is efficient or not efficient. No, think of the degrees of efficiency. Are, do, are we not efficient, low efficiency, medium level efficiency, or very high efficiency, or perfect efficiency? That's how you want to look at it. Are we how efficient are we not are we efficient or not and that's when the efficient market hypothesis comes in and let's start discussing it okay so this is the kind of stuff that the emh emh addresses since information is reflected in security prices quickly Knowing information when it is released does not, does an investor little good. What they're saying there is that when information comes out, the prices adjust on the market very, very fast. So no single investor might be able to take advantage of that information more than any other investor firms should expect to receive the fair value for securities that they sell firms cannot profit from fooling investors in an efficient market without going into too much detail uh, firms sometimes try to make announcements or what we call mimicking they uh, send some signals to the market trying to get investors to to have confidence in their stock, whatever reason. Uh, that's when you see the CEO of a company say, we're doing great, we're going to do this, we do that. It could be a variety of things they do, whether financial statements, reporting in a certain way, not reporting certain things. And I'm not talking about illegal activity. I'm just saying is spinning things the best they can. That's just an example. Uh, however, the truth comes out always and eventually. And what happens is when the real information comes out, those prices are going to reflect the reality of it, not these uh, these fooling investor attempts, like they say there. Let's talk a little bit about this efficient market, the way it would be if it's highly efficient or perfectly efficient versus what actually happens in the market. So let's talk about this green line here that has that steep change there and then there. Okay, so here's the stock price on this axis. These are days before and after some event. Some good news is what they say here. And we say good news because if it's a positive piece of information, then the stock is going to go up. So in an efficient market, as in perfectly efficient, not the degrees, well, the degree is perfect. What should happen then is that the uh, stock price is here, assuming nothing else is going on, right? And then here, 30 days before the, the good news, 20 days before the good news, nothing, 10 days before the good news, the good news comes out. Now, this assumes that when the good news comes out, everybody received it at the same time. 
or at least the ones participating in the market with that specific stock. So the good news comes out, the stock price goes up, the reaction to the good news to where it should go according, different news have different uh, value. So this represents the value that increase of that good news that came out. Could be anything, could be a, a profits, uh, uh, a new CEO that is better than the previous CEO. It could be just about anything that is good, that is be considered positive. And then it will immediately stop there at the price it's supposed to go. And this is like instant. It's not like there's no, there's no in between. It's all day zero there. And then the price continues moving along, assuming nothing else happens, and that would be perfect efficiency. But what really happens, or typically when you see on the, on the stock market, let's talk about this red line here. So what you have here is that people heard the news and everybody jumped in and some people overreacted to the good news. So that's why you see the red line going above what the actual price should have been. Eventually, people catch on like, oh, we overshot it. So let's go start going back down. And then there's a bit of a overreaction again going down, right? So it crosses the line we're supposed to be. Then they realize, oh, we went too low. Let's balance it out. And eventually they reach that line. So that's a very common event. Another thing that happens sometimes is a, what we call a delayed reaction. People hear the news, but don't react or they direct really slowly to it. Slowly, 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 and then it takes some time before it actually reaches where it's supposed to go. You may have a combination of both. A group of people or investors that go through this and a group of investors go through this. You may even have a group of investors that actually hit it right on the mark. So it's not that one or the other. All things could be, and what they do is they offset each other a little bit. But all of them could be happening by different groups. This slide here, it's pretty much showing the opposite. In this case, it's bad news. Something bad happened. They didn't get a contract they were supposed to get. A project failed. They had a loss of profits. Or they don't have, necessarily have to have a loss, but they, they have lower profits than what they expected. All kinds of things, right? So same thing. If it's bad news, you were here in a perfect efficient market, it will just drop there and then continue. But a delayed response, similar to the other one we just spoke about, that just takes time by people to react to it and to reach us here. And uh, overreaction, uh, you may hear this also as an underreaction. Uh, it just depends on what kind of like, but it's still an overreaction to the bad news. So they went way low. They said, okay, we went too low. Let's go back up. Then they kind of overshoot it again, and they go back that. Again, all three events could be happening at the same time with different groups of people or even different lines just going all over the place. It's just, that's just the way it is. The different types of efficiency. So earlier, we mentioned that it's not an on and off switch. It's a spectrum. There's like no efficiency, low efficiency, medium, high, perfect, right? So we tend to, for the efficient market hypothesis breaks it into three weak, they'll be like low, semi-strong, and strong. We'll discuss them further, but for right now, by definition, it'll be the weak form is security prices reflect all historical information, but all historical information only. There's no forward looking, there's no looking at the financial statements. It's pretty much like technical analysis. They're looking at the behavior of the prices in the past the ups and downs and the range and all kinds of technical data. And then just assumes uh, that the current price is reflected because of the past performance. So there's no other information but that in the price of the security, which would mean that is weak efficiency because there is other information out there that should be used. If now, we're saying if the price of the stock, it's only reflecting the history, the past history of the stock, then it's called weak efficiency because there's a lot more to it. Semi-strong, a little bit of the weak. 
So it's going to reflect all publicly available information. Now, it will include the historical prices and behavior of the stock. The semi strong, but it also adds any other public information like financial statements, for example, annual reports, any news about uh, future plans, anything that is public. So that's more efficient because now the price of the stock is embedding more information. So the more information that is being reflected on the price, the more efficient we become. Strong form will be where all information, privileged information, private information, public information, historical information, pretty much the price of the stock at any given time it already has built in all information available. And that will be, I guess, the perfect efficiency level. Now, notice that we don't have like a, a no efficiency stage. Uh, the, the lowest it goes is weak form. And then like a perfect strong form will be like your perfect efficiency. To expand on the weak form market efficiency, again, securities prices reflect all information found in, found in past prices and volume, standard deviation, volatility, et cetera. If the weak form of market efficiency holds, then technical analysis is of no value. Now, I'm going to take a moment to make something clear. None of these are saying that you cannot still earn a return by being in the stock market. What it's saying is that because if there's a certain level of efficiency, nobody can outperform other investors on a regular basis because they all have certain kind of information to work with. So it's not saying that you cannot earn returns. It's saying that you cannot earn, let's say, abnormal returns compared to other investors with the same information. And that's what they're talking about. So when they say technical analysis is of no value, meaning that you cannot get an advantage through technical analysis. Technical analysis is still applied in many strategies in order to have some expectation of what you're going to get. What we're saying is you're not going to have an advantage over the other investors. You're not going to be able to catch an abnormal return. Since stock prices only respond to new information, which by definition arrives randomly, stock prices are said to follow a random walk. So that's a way to say that Maybe you can do an estimation of where the stock price is going to be in the future with this information, but you're not going to be able to tell how it's going to get there, when it's going to be up and when it's going to be down. A lot of people try, and they typically end up with an average loss. Then why technical analysis fails? Again, it's not that it fails as you cannot use it in certain ways to try to uh, calculate an expected return, but it fails in the sense of not giving you an advantage. You're not going to just get up normal returns from it. Okay, investor behavior tends to eliminate any profit opportunity associated with stock price patterns. Excess profit, profits above of what normally would be. It's not that you cannot profit, you can still profit, just not abnormally, not above your competition. If it were possible to make big money by finding the pattern in the stock price movements, everyone would do it, and the profits would be competed away. So here's the thing. As we mentioned, it already doesn't work, right? But even if it did work, even if there was a way to do it, then everybody would do it, and then it normalizes that would be like everybody winning the lottery. You had to split the price or everybody made the same money. So there was no real big win. Uh, everybody, sure, everybody made a little bit of money, but nobody outdid the other one. So compared to everybody winning the lottery, then it's the value just dropped. You didn't make this uh, insane amount of money above everybody else. <clears throat> so, and that's what that means. Now, semi-strong for market efficiency 
historical price and volume information included. So it includes the weak form definitions, so includes historical prices. So like I said, it's still useful information. It's just that it, it won't give you abnormal returns. So in semi-strong, it will have that information, but it'll also have the public information like the accounting statements, the financial statements that are published, uh, information found on reports, and any other news information, pretty much anything out there. So now the price is reflecting that. But similar to the situation with a weak form, this information that everybody has access to. So you will do better at doing your calculations and estimations on a stock, but you're not going to do abnormally better above everybody else. There could be some differences of people that do better analysis than others, or were just more accurate on the calculations for X, Y reason, or the estimations they did different assumptions and parameters. But on average, no, there's no abnormal returns gained by this. So because of that, then it's efficient, semi-strong in this sense. The strong form will include the weak information, the semi-strong information, and any other information that typically, as we know it today, called private or privileged information. There's a nuance about those two words, but assume information that is not necessarily public to everybody. So if the stock price reflects also that information included, then it's it's a highly efficient, it's almost perfect efficiency. Or even then, yeah, perfect efficiency because there is nothing else going on that could be looked at in order to influence the price. The price is reflecting everything. And that's what it says in the last one. Strong form efficiency says that anything pertinent to the stock, anything and everything, and that is known to at least one investor is already incorporated in the security price. So the security price already has that there. Once again, then it's efficient and nobody can take advantage uh, of, of that information because it's already in the price. This is what it looks like graphically. This is the weak form information set of past prices only. This is the semi-strong, which has the weak form information and then the additional semi-strong information the additional public information of making it somewhat strong. And then if everything is included, there's nothing else outside, then that will be the, the strong form when all information relative to the stock is included in the price already. Now, what does the efficient market hypothesis does and does not say? Okay, investors can throw darts to select stocks. Like I said, there is almost but not quite true, but it's fairly true. You can count on that. There have been plenty of studies and experiments where they had the dart boards and, and documented and peer reviewed and published. There, I think there's another one where the cat was picking stocks. And uh, they, in many cases, outperformed professional stock pickers. And it's because they advertise heavily, letting you know that they're the greatest analysts and they can pick stocks. Um, there's a reason why they advertise so hard at active management in that way, because they have to sell it to you. I would like you to think of it this way. If somebody wins the lottery and then tells you, pay me $100 and I'll tell you the secrets to winning the lottery, you probably wouldn't do it because you know there's no secret. This is very similar in the finance world. Sometimes somebody has a good run and gets lucky a little bit, and they use that to advertise to people to pay them money to tell them the secrets of, of trading. But as we mentioned before, if they share that information with everybody, then there is no advantage of doing it. There's no reason to, to engage in that because then everybody's going to be winning the same amount. Uh, so it's pretty much the same thing. Somebody got lucky, won the lottery, and then they tell you, pay me and I'll show you how to win the lottery. You probably wouldn't do that. Same thing with these people advertising. I know how to pick stocks, pay me and I'll show you how, or I'll do it for you. When in reality, we have compared those, those uh, active managers with uh, dartboards and cats and other animals. I think there's another one with a monkey. But they have been done serious studies about this. 
An investor must still decide how risky a portfolio he wants, he or she wants, based on risk aversion and expected return. Now, there are still some human decisions that we made. And at that point, yes, training, knowledge, and experience will dictate how uh, you can improve your situation by understanding risk return rewards. And notice they use the word portfolio there, not individual stocks. Prices are random and uncaused. Now, there is intrinsic value. So the price eventually will average out to what its true value is. The problem is there's ups and downs and nobody can predict because of the random walk when it's going to be up and by how much, when it's going to be down and by how much, and how long it's going to stay down and by how much, how long it's going to stay up and by how much. Too random, too many potential outcomes. Price reflect information. That's it. There's nothing else to add to that. The price of the stock reflects information. The only thing that uh, uh, they may cause fluctuations is how people interpret that information, which we'll elaborate in that in, in a few slides later. The price change is driven by new information, which by definition arrives randomly, back to the randomness. Therefore, financial managers cannot time stock and bond sales. So market timing, those are the people telling you, oh, I know when it's going to go up and it's going to go down, give me money and I'll, I'll show you how or I'll do it for you. No, nobody knows. And like I said, sometimes, yes, they get some lucky guesses in there and they do well and they use that to advertise. But on average, over the long term, they always underperform. There's studies, plenty of them out there. The evidence, the record of the efficient market hypothesis is extensive. And when I say extensive, we're talking about decades. The uh, analyzing at the portfolio level and the individual stocks, uh, it can be about efficiency. It can go back into the 40s and 50s. And then there's just research after research, Nobel Prize winners and everything dealing with this. Studies fall into three broad categories. Are changes in stock prices random? Study after study, random, no way to predict it. Are there profitable trading rules? Same thing. You're going to play a trading rule, and it might go well for a little bit, but the idea is that it's not sustainable. You cannot repeat it. So, And that's the problem. Just because some trading review you follow worked one time, unless you can repeat it consistently, then no, that's not a trading rule. You just got lucky. You just won the lottery. Event studies. Does the market quickly and accurately respond to new information? Uh, yes. How event studies are very popular and plenty of them all over finance. And um, sure, it does measure how fast stock prices are. Uh, reaction information, and it is pretty fast. We'll say a little more, more about that in a moment. The record of professionally managed investment firms. It's bad. Study after study, it always shows that these professionally managed uh, investment firms uh, don't outperform passive uh, management. They always underperform. Uh, and also, they may have like a good run here and there, as I mentioned, but then when you take away uh, all the transaction costs like taxes, management fees, uh, commissions, et cetera, then again, you end up with less money than you would have if you just did passive management. This uh, thing they're talking about professionally managed, if you want to... If you were to like Google stuff to get more information on why, uh, you want to Google more active management versus passive management. Professionally managed, they're, they're addressing the active management people. It doesn't mean that you don't go to one of these brokerage firms and use their services because there's passive management. For more information on that, just Google and compare active versus passive management. That's what addressing here. The active management uh, has a bad record. Are changes in stock prices random? So more on that. Can we really tell? Well, here's uh, some information on that. Many psychologists and statisticians believe that most people want to see patterns even when faced with pure randomness. 
Yes, in statistics, they do plenty of studies of this, and in psychology and other social sciences, humans like to look for patterns or even see patterns where there is none. So there is a psychological bias already that happens. People claiming to see patterns in stock price movements are probably seeing optical illusions. That's just one way to say what we just said. Uh, they just, there's, there's this self-convincing, yeah, I see it. I see a pattern, I see a pattern. When no actual study of, you know, scientific study has been able to show that these patterns actually exist. A matter of degree. Even if we can spot patterns, we need to have returns that beat our transaction costs. Going back to what I said, that even if you catch a, a trade strategy for a little while after you take the transaction costs, uh, you're going to end up the same or less with less returns. So then it's, it's, just, it's not worth it. Random stock price changes support weak form efficiency. So there's this evidence that uh, we there is some weak form efficiencies out there. One thing to understand, I should have mentioned this earlier, um, we are most of the time as a whole in the semi-strong efficient market. Uh, however, individual stocks, depending on, on, the, on the company or the information out there, any given time, you could be in a weak form situation uh, or closer to weak form situation because you can be in between also. So that's why they say like there is some things that, that come out that support weak form efficiency. So within the market, you might be able to separate in some areas, have a weak form while others have semi-strong. But as a whole, we are typically in a semi-strong efficient market. Event studies, we mentioned this a moment ago. Uh, they're one type of test of the semi-strong form of market efficiency. So remember this, this includes the historical prices and other public information like financial statements, news, et cetera. So really they just, uh, these studies, uh, without getting too much into it, it, it just like it sounds, it studies an event. So let's say somebody wants to know what happens when a CEO dies to the stock price. So they start looking throughout history the time CEO dies unexpectedly and uh, or sudden and see what happens to the stock price. And then through other pieces of information, what have found, for example, that if this CEO was considered a bad CEO and the CEO dies, then the stock price goes up. If it was considered a good CEO and the CEO died, then the stock price goes down. That's just an example too. So it's not just uh, the same event can have a different impact depending on the other information around the event. Oh, also these studies show the underreactions, overreactions, delayed reaction that we spoke about earlier. When they study and analyze the stock price movement, it also shows that. Here's just a note on the record of mutual funds. This is going back to those uh, active managed portfolios that we mentioned that they don't do well. Uh, so yeah, many studies have been done. And... Uh, the performance of these actively managed mutual funds. Mutual funds are typically actively managed. That's why we bring them up. A lot of things are changing. Uh, we have ETF now, which are very similar to mutual fund, but they don't necessarily have to be actively managed. And there's some other nuanced difference, but their portfolios very similar to mutual funds with some key differences. But mutual funds are a good way to test this uh, professionally managed uh, funds versus some other market indexes. And uh, that's where those studies uh, have shown that the record of these actively managed or professionally managed funds don't do too well. Or at least nowhere near what they advertise. So let's talk about this strong form efficient market hypothesis. One group of studies of strong form market efficiency investigates insider trading. 
So this is uh, what it is to go like that. Remember, strong form means that all information available should be in the stock price. Earlier, I mentioned that we are typically in a semi-strong semi efficient market. And the reason is because, yes, there's still information that is privileged or private at any given time that only insiders know in the company. Uh, so the price does not reflect that information. And this is why uh, insider trading is illegal. We do know that there's always going to be some private information that has not become public yet. Managers planning what they're going to do, strategic things, uh, corporate uh, competencies that are kept secret. Just to give a couple of uh, maybe not so perfect examples, but Coca-Cola and Kentucky Fried Chicken, they both always talk a little, a lot about their secret formulas and secret recipes. If there were insiders that knew that that formula, that recipe was going to become public, that's a piece of information they have that would definitely have an impact on the stock price. Um, and uh, so there's always going to be that. Now, they just it's okay to have that information, that private information. It's not okay to trade based on information that is private. And that's why insider trading is illegal. So because the studies have shown that be like several days before an event happens, the stock price starts moving in the direction of that event, what, what the impact will be on the event. So that means, uh, and there's more to it, but the simple explanation is evidence that insider trading goes on, uh, meaning that some people are trading on private information and stock price starts moving in, the, in that direction. Now, this is not saying that we can point out who did insider trading. This only shows that it's seen, there's evidence suggesting, very strong evidence suggesting that insider trading does happen. And because from time to time somebody gets caught, well, we only catch the ones that get caught, to put it that way, means that it's, it's definitely happened uh, more than what we know. And that is why we're not a strong form efficient market now the behavioral challenge rationality people are not always rational uh i think that's self-explanatory uh, many investors fail to diversify some trade too much and seem to try to maximize taxes by selling winners and holding losers that last part what they're saying is that a rational person will try to minimize taxes but what happens is that a lot of people, as they invest, when they have a stock that is doing well, they go ahead and sell it because they want to collect the profit, right? Because you don't get your money until you sell the stock. Uh, and then the ones that are not making money, they're holding them because they're just hoping it's going to recover or something like that. But what happens when you do that, you're maximizing taxes. There's some tax strategies that you can apply to still uh, that will optimize or get better like that. Matter of fact, a lot of brokerage companies now have uh, an option where you click on when you're going to sell something, uh, some some stocks, you can click on tax optimizer and then it presents you with uh, the ideal trading of the shares you hold uh, to minimize the taxes. But it's not rational. And that's what I'm trying to get to. People will behave irrational. Examples of behavioral biases that we know overconfidence. A lot of people, they really think they know what they're doing. Disposition effect. Seeking pride and avoiding regret. Okay, so uh, this overconfidence, I'm going to use an example of cryptocurrencies, which is very common now in you hear the good news and the bad news and the good news and the bad news. The example I'm going to use about people's overconfidence or disposition effect, when, let's use Bitcoin, for example. That's a popular one. When Bitcoin is going up, you see everybody on social media and talking to everybody about how they're doing great with their Bitcoin and they know what they're doing. They're experts on trading cryptocurrency. They invite you to join in, et cetera. However, when it's down, 
there's this silence. You don't see any posts about it on their social media. You don't hear them talking about it. And that's one example of that. And that overconfidence may make may might make them buy more. And then the disposition effect makes them sell when they shouldn't or just, you know, uh, go quiet. Familiarity, represent, representativeness, that would be our reaction. Conservatism, underreaction, similar things that we spoke about in the graphs earlier. Uh, risk-taking, um, risk-taking, well, because people have different risk tolerance, then they're going to behave different uh, to the market movements. Independent deviations from rationality. Psychologists argue that people deviate from rationality in predictable ways. So representativeness. So that's opti very optimistic and aggressive and overconfidence kind of falls here. Drawing conclusions from too little data. They hear one, two piece of information. They say, that's all I need to know. And they jump in. When there could have been a lot more public information they should have considered. This can lead to bubbles and security prices. That's one out of many things that lead to bubbles. You hear them all the time. And that's what happens. People jump in with very little information. And for whatever euphoria they get uh, or happens, then it creates the bubble. Conservatism, people are too slow in adjusting their beliefs to new information. Now, this goes both ways. Uh, meaning that something good is happening, but they move too slow to get the position and it lowers their 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 returns because they act late. But that's in the good news, like it was going up the price, for example. But that also happens on the way down. So bad news come out, but they're scared to sell for whatever reason, or the bad news came out, the price dropped instead of exiting, as we mentioned earlier, they just don't want to have that regret. They just hold on and they don't tax, uh, tax, uh, maxima, tax optimize. Uh, security prices seem to respond too slowly to earnings of prices. That's just talking about the conservatism. Arbitrage. We did discuss one form of arbitrage in the previous chapter. Uh, here, we're just going to touch on it as part of the behavioral uh, and, and efficient market hypothesis uh, piece. Uh, the process. Suppose that your that your superior rational analysis shows that company ABC is overpriced. Now notice that rational and superior mean that you did a high level of analysis and it was rational, and ABC is overpriced, meaning the price is too high and it should come back down. Arbitrage will suggest that you should short the shares, you should short sell them, and make a profit that way. Different strategies on arbitrage. We're not going to get into the details here. After the rest of the investors come to their senses, you make money because you're smart enough to sell high and buy low. Now, in a perfect world, that's what would happen. You notice that it's overpriced. Let's say that you are correct. Your analysis is correct. It was overpriced and it has to come down. And it will. But back to something we mentioned earlier. You can, you can calculate that it has to come down, but you will never be able to time it. You don't know when it's going to come down, how fast it's going to come down, but how much is going to come down exactly, to be precise. And that's what they're trying to say on this slide. But what if the rest of the investment community does not come to their senses in time? They will eventually come to their senses. You just don't know when. And without getting too many details, when you short a position... If the stock price doesn't go down with a certain time, amount of time, you're going to start losing some money. And to be even worse, if the stock price starts going up because the irrational investors are definitely not catching on on time and they're on the other side, then it's even worse for you. So what, what we're trying to say is that you can be 100% right. You just don't know when it's going to kick in. And that is the part that will get you. And that's what we're, we're trying to say. Even if you're right, the, mar the market being wrong will, will make you suffer. Reviewing the differences, financial economists have sorted themselves into three camps. Uh, and and this, is, this is definitely a big battle. 
uh, it's been going on for years and years, maybe decades by now, uh, between the market efficiency defenders, the behavioral finance advocates, and those that say like, hey, we just don't know. Now, here's the thing. Now, this is one take that I would like you to consider. You see, the, the market efficiency defenders and the behavioral finance defenders, they always say, like, oh, it's either one or the other. But there's a view between these two where they coexist and live together. Market efficiency, you can view it as in, over time, the market is efficient. So it's going to average out to the right price, to the intrinsic values. So let's say long-term, for example, even though prices do adjust quickly, but overall, at the macro level, and even the long period of time, market efficiency does play out. So it's not that it doesn't exist or it's not going to happen the way it predicts. Yes, it's there. Behavioral finance, however, we discussed earlier uh, that people just behave in different ways and rational and that they overreact or underreact. So market efficiency does say that the price will get to where it needs to be according to the information. But we do know that there are overreactions and underreactions and there are bubbles. So behavioral finance still happens too within market efficiency. So while the market is being efficient, moving up and down and these overreactions, the behavioral finance will explain those over and under reactions or the bubbles. So behavioral finance is things that happen while the market is happening, the market efficiency is happening. So I guess what I'm trying to get to is one way to view it is that behavioral finance lives within market efficiency. If behavioral finance didn't exist, like it's not a thing, then those underreactions or reactions and bubbles then uh, wouldn't be showing up on the studies. So they don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. Behavioral finance can live within market efficiency. If you look at, at you look at it from the perspective that when there's a price change, the time it takes to actually get to the right price, that's what behavioral finance is, is playing a role there. But they still fight each other a lot. Implications for corporate finance. Efficient market hypothesis has important implications for corporate finance. The price of a company stock cannot be affected by a change in accounting. Earlier in this lecture, we spoke about companies cannot fool the investors or they try, they, it doesn't work. And that's one example. You can try to change the way you count your books and the reporting and uh, uh, do any kind of like upfront changes that are not illegal. There's things that are legal just trying to make it look, but it's just not going to work. The price will reflect that, the reality. Financial managers cannot time issues of stocks and bonds using public available information. Uh, we mentioned this many times already in this lecture. Uh, even if you're right about the direction the stock is going to go, you don't know when. Corporate managers should concentrate on running the business and not speculate on security offerings. There's actually... a uh, some laws that restrict companies on how much they can speculate within the, the financial markets. Uh, it should not become a, a profit point. You should stick within your industry. You still can use the financial markets to hedge and do other uh, strategies, but only so much. Uh, but generally speaking, even if you have those, those regulations, the management should be concentrated on running the business and add value to the business because that's how you can get sustainability, and long-term stock price increases instead of speculation because nobody is able to beat the market with the speculation. They typically lose money. Markets are more objective than firm managers. Uh, when we say markets, just think of it as a whole. Yes, you have behavioral finance in there and people like that, but it's still going to be 
uh, if you go back to economics and visible head of the market, it's going to not have any biases as a whole. The biases are out. It's going to move where it's going to go for equilibrium and efficiency. Managers are going to have those personal biases, bad information or bad choices, bad decisions, bad judgment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's just another way to say that. Or that's just a way to say this is one of the reasons why individuals cannot beat the market. The objectivity of the market is always going to be superior. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this video. See you on the next one.